deposits in the world. Uh, his book, <laughs> Are We Screwed?, won the 2018 Green Prize for Sustainable Literature. He's a regular contributor to the Tai and to Vice, and he lives in Brooklyn. Um, I want to take this opportunity also to congratulate Jeff because just yesterday, the Petroleum Papers was named a finalist for this year's Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Literary Nonfiction, which is one of the most prestigious book awards in the country. So let's give it up for Jeff. <laughs> and Sandy Garosino is a uh, prominent political commentator who appears frequently on radio and podcasts on television. She is the public affairs columnist for Canada's National Observer and a former Crown Prosecutor. And she's written many, many columns on the influence of the oil industry in Canadian politics. So uh, Jeff and Sandy are going to chat for about 40 minutes and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Jorge. Is this where this is working, that's good. Always a good start. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, good. Nice to see you all. Thanks for, thanks for coming out. And uh, Jeff and I just discovered in the uh, uh, getting ready for this, we're both from Alberta, and we both actually had a lot, <laughs> had a lot or no, a lot of just sort of in the blood knowledge about the oil and gas industry. So it transplanted me to here, and you're now in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And, and being a famous writer with the nominated for awards and everything. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. So um, I've been spending quite a bit of time reading this phenomenal book, which I encourage you all to pick up because uh, there's just a, a, an incredible wealth of especially Canadian-specific uh, um, uh, research and factual background uh, that we'll get into a little bit tonight. But I wanted to start out by noting that um, Catherine Hayhoe, a climate scientist, a very prominent climate sci scientist with Texas Tech, um, was tweeting last July that um, climate is the most politically polarized issue facing Congress and the President in 2022, according to the Pew Research um, Pew Research Center. The by far the most, more polarized than immigration, more polarized than any anything else. It's remarkable how incredibly politically polarized uh, this debate has become. And I'm old enough to remember when Margaret Thatcher and George H.W. Bush and other conservative, prominent conservative politicians were on board with the climate science. We're on board with, okay, we're going to have to do something about it. And what the hell happened? Over to you. What <laughs> happened, Jeff? <laughs> Um, the short answer is that a bunch of the leading oil companies in the world came up with a campaign to take a pretty nonpartisan issue that everyone agreed. Um, if we fixed it, it would be pretty good for the economy and good for the environment. And a bunch of the, the big multinational oil and gas companies that I name in this book deliberately set out to destroy that consensus by lying to all of us and planting doubt and uncertainty in the media. And they did this over the course of many decades and were kind of living with the, the chaos that has resulted from that. When did the industry first themselves become aware that this climate science existed, and when did they? The, when when were they satisfied that that in fact the research um, um, was solid and 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 very conclusive? The first warning that I talk about in the book, and I think it's one of the first major climate warnings to the oil and gas industry that anybody knows about, took place in 1959 at Columbia University in New York City. And a whole bunch of executives and politicians and other influential people were gathered at this event to celebrate the oil and gas industry's 100th birthday. So it was in 1959. One of the speakers that day was Edward Teller, who was one of the inventors of the atomic bomb. So he's no environmentalist or, or progressive or anything like that. And Edward Teller goes up on stage and he tells the people assembled in the room um, that he's been learning about this new science around climate change. And 
Although most people don't know about the greenhouse gas effect, Teller says it could potentially be more catastrophic than nuclear war to the planet. And, and Teller goes through, he explains the science in very basic steps. He says when you burn oil and gas, it releases this emission, carbon dioxide emissions into the air. This could potentially res melt the polar ice caps. And one day, even New York City, where this conference was happening, could be underwater. And sitting right beside Edward Teller on stage, hearing this warning, is Robert Dunlop, the CEO of this company called Sun Oil, which four years later was up in northern Alberta, starting to develop the first commercial oil sands operation. And so before anyone was commercially extracting oil from Alberta's oil sands, um, the top executive had already learned about climate change and the destruction it could wreak around the planet. And, but this went on, there was more research, there was more um, data, there was, Exxon became aware of it, there were other studies, I mean, I, as I was pointing out to you, there was, I, we have a 1970 Sports Illustrated with climate change as the, as the cover story in 1970, 52, mm -hmm. 52 years ago. Um, so the 1959 is the first that you've, that you've encountered. Mm -hmm. What other studies developed through the years and what was, the, what was industry's response to those studies? Well, I think it's what's crucial to realize is that the oil and gas industry, were they were some of the original climate change experts. And they had some of the best scientists in the world working on this stuff way before the, the public was aware. Of, of what a big issue this would become. And so um, Exxon Mobil, or it wasn't known as Exxon Mobil, Exxon in the 70s spent a million dollars turning a super tanker into a scientific research station on the ocean, um, measuring what happens to carbon dioxide when it's released into the atmosphere. And you know you can go through all the big companies and, and they, they were all paying or hiring some of the best scientists to work on this stuff. Um, Shell um, was contracting with um, a top climate research institute in, in the UK in the early 1980s and, and getting, getting reports warning the company that as a result of burning oil and gas, potentially entire countries would have to be abandoned someday due to flooding and other impacts. And it named Bangladesh specifically as one of those countries. And so the, the reports and warnings generated within the industry were highly credible. It was circulated to top people at the companies. And the response of these companies wasn't to bring this information to the public, to change their business models, to lobby politicians for the most aggressive action. Instead, the response was to run media campaigns saying none of this is real. Even though they knew it, it was real. Yeah, they were getting, and the executives at these companies were getting scientific reports all the time telling them that this was a crisis. Would you say that the scientific reports that they had commissioned or that they knew about and studied, that their knowledge was actually uh, um, ahead of the curve of, for instance, government officials or the, mm. or the EPA or, or um, other environmental agencies in government? Absolutely. The... The oil and gas industry's knowledge of this stuff was, was way ahead of everyone else. And this, this was incredibly economically useful to the companies because knowing all of this stuff before, um, policymakers allowed them to set the terms of the debate. So how did they go about um, planting doubt or planting uncertainty or undermining the science that they themselves were satisfied was was conclusive. How did they go about that? Well, in a lot of the the confidential oil and gas industry documents that I reviewed for this book, you can see a shift start to happen um, around the late 1980s, where a bunch of these companies internally realized that climate change was going to be the next big issue that they were going to have to deal with, and. 
they, they prepared for that by um, researching not only the science, but climate change solutions. Um, and so they would have the upper hand in order, um, you know, when talking about this stuff in public or lobbying politicians. And so um, the Exxon owned company Imperial Oil, for example, studied what um, a carbon tax could do for climate change in the early 1990s. And Imperial um, concluded as a result of this modeling that such a policy could probably halt climate change in Canada and result in emissions starting to decline. And it wouldn't be bad for the economy. There would be a bit of a hit at first, and then the government stimulus that would be spent on green industries would more than offset that. And so Imperial also determined that such a policy would be really bad for its profits in the oil sands. And so it created a memo in 1993 urging executives um, in Canada and the US to talk about economic uncertainties um, with people in the media, with people in government, essentially trying to, to sabotage this solution before anyone was even talking about it. And uh, yes, yeah, so um, and, and Imperial Oil is a subsidiary or is majority owned by Exxon. Correct. Yeah, that's it's, correct. It's a, that's the Canadian company. How much did Imperial Oil strategy influence um, uh, Exxon or other or um, the American oil industry in their in their dealings and negotiations with um, government or their public posturing? I think what Exxon was doing in Canada through Imperial Oil had a huge impact on the debate in the U.S. around climate change. And so s specifically, like in the early 1990s, um, lots of people were just becoming aware that climate change even existed. And Imperial Oil had known about the science for decades by that point, and it was way ahead of the game. Um, it was modeling various climate change solutions in Canada, the impact that might have on emissions, the economic impact. And the same consulting groups that helped develop these studies in Canada later worked on campaigns um, designed to influence the United States government. And so in the 1990s, there was a group called the Global Climate Coalition um, that hired um, experts, or they were deemed climate experts from universities, but they didn't actually have much background in climate science. Um, people named you know, Fred Singer and Patrick Michaels, and the, the Climate Coalition put these people in front of media to say the science is uncertain, we can't um, enact potentially damaging policies based on it. And, and a lot of the same groups that worked on Imperial stuff in the 90s also worked on, on these campaigns in the US. And of course, like Exxon is, is one of the biggest players in the, the oil and gas industry. So anything it does influences not only the entire sector, but um, they have the power to sway government, to sway public opinion. And so I think the work done in Canada was incredibly influential. So uh, tell me how, um, how did this become a partisan issue? How did this, how did this lead to a left-right divide on this subject? Because you would think that certainty, uncertainty, doubt, that goes, that cuts across uh, cuts across political uh, orientation, mm -hmm. but it has really uh, emerged as a hugely um, partisan issue. Did you see evidence as to how that how that happened? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people first started talking about climate change, it wasn't a super partisan thing. There were Republican administrations who were committed to fixing the problem. Um, in Canada, conservative governments were interested in doing something about it. And one of the first efforts I found evidence of to really destroy that consensus took place at this conference in Washington, D.C. that was, I think it was in 1990 or, or around that date, and it was set up by a think tank that had been founded by um, the Koch brothers. And so at this conference, um, a bunch of these sorts of fake scientists that I had mentioned gathered together to figure out a way um, to convince conservatives especially that dealing with climate change was a horrible thing. Um, 
And it's, it's really interesting reading the, the brochure from that conference because um, the people there are, are communicating to conservatives that what they were trying to do in terms of sowing uncertainty about the science might have, might have seemed a little bit strange or unusual. There's, there's a few paragraphs that say, you know, like why would, why would a conservative um, doubt that taking action on climate change is good? Like, is, isn't this seen as a sort of a neutral thing? And so, you know, this Coke Industries funded group and the people who showed up at this conference, they deliberately communicated that they were working to undermine this consensus and turn um, any conservative they could over to the idea that fixing climate change is bad and probably the problem doesn't even exist. And we're still living with the consequences of that. How far behind are we? I mean, you're talking about things that happened in the 90s. Where might we have been already without this campaign? I mean, I would, for the, the book I interviewed, um, a former scientist at Exxon who worked within the company for um, over a decade before he was forced out um, for asking hard questions about the company's climate change denial. And I, I put that same question to him. I said, you know, what, what might have happened if Exxon had acted on all of this information it was learning about climate change and the information it was learning about climate change solutions in the early 90s? If Exxon had used all of its vast like global lobbying power to convince governments to take this seriously, what would have happened? And the scientists I spoke with said, you know, we would be in just like a fundamentally better place right now in dealing with the problem. Um, global emissions might have already peaked and we might be coming down the backside already. Um, the technologies that we need to fix the crisis, they're developing fast, but they would be much more mainstream now um, than, than they currently are. And, and likely we wouldn't be seeing the, the crazy impacts like the flooding of the lower mainland last year, for example. Or the heat dome that cost hundreds of lives here, mm -hmm. here in the lower mainland and it's just and, and burnt up, um, burnt Lytton, BC and, and all the fires. And this is imposing actually huge costs now on society, largely in cities. And you go in in your in the book, you go into some of the litigation that is coming out and, and the history of litigation. Tell us a little bit about the history of how the litigation started and, and how it was received at the time and what are the more recent developments. So in, in the United States right now, there are about 20 um, cities and other jurisdictions that are um, suing the oil and gas industry for lying to the public about climate change. And I interviewed one of the class action lawyers who's central to this whole litigation movement. His name is Steve Berman, and he has a really fascinating backstory because he was also one of the attorneys who worked on the, on the litigation against the big tobacco companies. And when Steve Berman first got involved in efforts to hold cigarette makers responsible for people getting cancer from smoking, um, a lot of his legal peers at the time in the 1990s thought that that was like a really dumb thing to do. Because um, the tobacco companies had never lost a case. They had the highest paid lawyers. Um, and, and Steve Berman's own partner at his legal firm warned him that if he took on this case, it could bankrupt the firm and they'd be out of jobs. And um, a few years later, um, Steve Berman was helping negotiate one of the biggest class action settlements in history. It was a $206 billion settlement against the tobacco companies. And so um, a short while after that, he thought, well, you know, maybe we could use this same strategy against oil and gas. And, you know, it's... Was it, sorry, was it 206 million or billion? Billion. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and... And so when, when Steve Berman decided he was going to start leading some of the first climate change litigation against oil and gas companies, 
it was it wasn't just like a metaphorical link that he was making. Um, some of the same trade organizations that had advised the tobacco companies on how to lie to the public mm -hmm. about cancer also advise oil companies on how to lie to the public about climate change. And use the same and use the same strategy: plant doubt, mm -hmm. uncertainty. Oh, it doesn't really cause cancer. The science isn't settled. We don't really know yet. Exactly. Yeah, it was the same strategy devised by many of the same people. And so, Steve Berman thought, I'm. I'm going to try to to bring a big case against the oil and gas industry. And so one of the first big ones was announced by San Francisco and Oakland a few years ago. Now that's grown into more than 20 across the US. And Vancouver recently took the step of um, the city council agreed um, to, to set aside some funding for, for future litigation. And if the city here decides to move forward, it would be the first major city in Canada to, to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of um, what the damages are and what kind of costs um, that, that society, I mean, we're, we've, we've seen the, the, the heat dome, we've seen the fires, the, the incredible damage to the environment, but just the costs that um, uh, municipalities and, and governments are going, and taxpayers are going to have to bear, do you have any sense of what those costs are? I mean, it's got to be a huge number, and we were talking about this before the event. Um, some people in Vancouver have estimated the annual damages from climate change to be about $50 million a year, and, and you had rightly pointed out that it's likely much, much higher than that because, you know, there's a sewer, sewage system in this city that depends on having, you know, a relatively stable sea level, and once we start to see the sea level rise, that's Predict, predicted by many scientists, that's going to wreak havoc on so much infrastructure in the city, and we could be looking at bills in in the hundreds of millions or or billions of dollars. And so, you know, essentially, the the large oil and gas companies have gotten a pretty they've had a pretty good ride. Um, they've become some of the wealthiest companies in the history of the world. And all of these externalities are now being forced onto cities like Vancouver. And so that's kind of the basis for bringing this type of litigation um, is, is to make these companies pay for, for the damages that are linked in part to their business model. Now, did you speak to Berman himself, the lawyer who was doing these, who was bringing these actions? Yeah, I went down to Seattle a few years ago and interviewed him in his office and he I mean he had fascinating stuff to say but as as a lawyer he didn't talk more than was like absolutely <laughs> necessary so I got a lot of like one or two word answers to my questions um, he would say he would end sentences just abruptly and not say any more than than he needed to but it was still it's fascinating to speak with him because he's really at the center of a lot of this litigation right now. It's really interesting because I remember when the um, when the uh, the tobacco litigation first started, it would be individual plaintiffs who would bring their actions and and first there was the question, well, did this cause the cancer that that um, you that you got or could it have been any other cause? And also, didn't you know the risks? So individual plaintiffs were not successful. They didn't have success. And the real key was when um, government, uh, when government levels were going to, were ending up having to pay the health costs for um, for people who were victimized. And this is this is what ended up really breaking breaking things open for big tobacco. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, one of the uh, issues that uh, is identified as a as problematic for um, for bringing an action against big oil is, you know, well, is this typhoon or is this um, winter storm or is this heat wave? You know, establishing the causation, not just um, between oil and gas and climate, but these defendants and mm -hmm. climate. Um, so I, I think that there's, it's going to be interesting to watch that play out, but it is mm -hmm. also interesting to me that 
most of the litigants, I, there are some exceptions. I believe there's a, um, a civic government, and it is happening at the municipal level, most of this litigation, because mm -hmm. um, climate change damage actually hits cities more than than anything else. It's, it mm -hmm. hits though that critical infrastructure. So, um, but it's interesting that it's almost all coastal American cities right now that are bringing this litigation, which I think places Vancouver kind of squarely in this mm -hmm. in this area. Well, and and yeah, for for a long time it was it was really hard to say like did this specific oil company's emissions can they be linked to this you know specific heat dome or or this hurricane? And those are those are really difficult questions to answer. But a lot of the the litigation that's being filed actually hinges on a much simpler question, which is, did these companies lie to the public about climate change? And and there's a lot of compelling evidence that they did. And to give one example, this organization, the Global Climate Coalition, whose members included Exxon um, and just about every other major oil and gas company in the world. Um, it produced an internal report in the 90s um, where an, an expert at the coalition examined the contrarian climate change theories that were being put forward by people like Fred Singer and, and others whose job was to sow doubt in the media. And so internally, an expert at the coalition examined those theories and determined that they weren't credible that in fact climate change was real and it was being caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And a few months later, the Global Climate Coalition um, did a major media blitz saying climate change isn't happening, it's the science is unsettled. And so internally the group had acknowledged that what it was making public was bad science and wasn't credible and it still went forward and put it out anyway. And so in a court of law, you could point to that as pretty clear evidence that a lie was being told to the public. But then the question is going to be, and, like, would government have acted anyway? And I guess that's part, been, and this is one of the issues is, well, the cost to the economy. I think this is what, what governments, why governments always resisted acting was mm -hmm. because they were, um, looking at numbers largely produced by the oil and gas industry that the economic impact was going to be devastating to mm -hmm. the economy. What was the, um, what were the estimates about the impact on the Canadian economy that came out of um, uh, the, the oil and gas industry on, say, carbon tax? What was so interesting about some of that modeling was that when Imperial Oil was looking at the national impact of a carbon tax in the early 90s, it found that the, the impact to the economy, you might not even really notice it. Like, it definitely wouldn't destroy the economy. It would probably even be good for the economy. And the reason for that is because if governments started taxing carbon emissions in a big way, they would have tons and tons of money that they could spend on a big green stimulus. And this would help create jobs and, and companies and entirely new industries all across the country. And so the impact on the economy would be pretty good from that. And where you mainly see the losses um, is in the profits of, of companies like Imperial Oil in the oil sands. And they specifically um, state that in one of the documents that I've reviewed, um, that if such a policy were to go forward, it could cost them about a billion dollars every year um, and and meanwhile the company acknowledged that in most of the rest of the country the economic impact would be minimal or probably even positive where do you jeff where do you see things now it feels to me that that we've kind of crossed a rubicon in public opinion it, it sort of feels like we that a certain momentum has that there has been a shift, that we've kind of got past the, is it happening, is it not happening? But I don't know, you're younger, what is, what is your sense and, and your sense about where governments are and, and, and where climate action is today? I think we have seen a pretty big shift in some ways, but in 
other ways we're sort of in the same place that we've always been. And, and so one example of like the positive shift is the, the Biden administration agreeing to, to spend, I think it's something like $200 billion on, on green stimulus in something that was announced called the Inflation Reduction Act. And that, that's the direct result of, of, of public anger and concern about climate change coalescing in a bunch of social movements that pressured the government to make this type of spending a big priority. And it's, the bill has definitely been watered down um, and, and is, is not really satisfying to, to many different people, but it's still one of the largest actions that the US has, has ever taken on, on this issue. But you know, in, in another sense, the, the lies and the disinformation being spread by the industry for decades is, is still happening. Um, and there's, there's a congressional investigation going on right now in, in the United States um, about this effort. And it recently made public a whole bunch of internal documents from companies like Shell and Exxon. Um, and in these documents, people inside the companies say that, you know, while in public, the companies are committed to fixing the environment and climate change internally, they don't actually care about any of that stuff and it's all just marketing and if you want you can go see some of these these documents and it's like pretty damning stuff and this just happened over the last year or so yeah well we've and we've all seen those wonderful exxon ads about how much they're doing to help the environment you know they've got these their 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 special research which amounts to mm. what what percent of their actual revenues mm is is goes into I think it's like one percent or something yeah yeah something something especially minute but it's mm -hmm. very good advertising makes good ads mm -hmm. but so where do where do things where do we go now what is what lies ahead we've still got so much to do where do, where are you putting your energy I'm just trying to put my energy into changing the narrative around climate change because for so long it's we've kind of been stuck on this idea that it's our individual fault for this big global problem and and the idea has been like we all contribute to it we're all complicit we all drive somehow heat our homes we need these things um it'd be impossible to live without it and therefore we all bear responsibility for this and no one can be singled out and blamed, and that's actually a pretty, um, to me, that's a very depressing narrative because it means the only way we can fix this thing is by changing the behavior of like seven billion people around the world, and that just seems impossible to me. And and instead, I want people to know, like through this this book and all of the the industry documents I looked at, that there was a deliberate strategy waged on behalf of these powerful polluting companies to confuse all of us, to block action at every turn, and, and to basically sabotage many of the best opportunities we had for, for fixing this thing. And I think that's a more hopeful narrative because, you know, it, it's that, that would tell me if I was part of a social movement or, or some other campaign that, you know, there are pressure points um, and, and there are, you know, individual companies and executives that are responsible for a lot of the inaction we've seen. And if we start directing energy and outrage towards those, those pressure points, I think we would start seeing a lot of action very quickly. Did you encounter anybody, you mentioned this, the one person who I think had been from Exxon, I think that was uh, Enrique, um, was it Rodriguez? Was that Enrique Rosero. Oh, yeah. Rosero, beg pardon. Um, what do you think is, did, did you get any sense that anybody feels bad about having done this? Mm. I mean, this is a ca catastrophic impact on the world. Has, did, has anybody felt bad about participating in this? I mean, I'm really interested by that question too. And so when I got the opportunity to speak with someone who was trusted within Exxon and worked at the company for 10 years. That's, that's what I wanted to know too. And in fact, Enrique had been so important to the company that he helped develop a plan for 
Exxon to develop um, reserves worth 5 billion barrels of oil off the coast of South America. So he was deep in it. And, and Enrique always felt that the environmentalists and, and other people were exaggerating the role of Exxon. Um, and he figured that he worked with a lot of, of very capable, intelligent people inside the company and that they were really trying that their best to address some of these solutions. And, and Exxon has all sorts of slogans and, in, and sort of internal messaging that it uses to make its employees um, feel like they're actually helping to fix climate change. Um, and so in, Enrique believed a lot of this for a while. He believed that if we're going to, um, to, to solve the climate emergency, the world would still need oil. Exxon was in the best position to provide that. But as Enrique started seeing some of the reporting come out over the past few years showing how much his employer had lied to the public, he felt really disturbed about that. And when he had the opportunity at a, a town hall forum that probably looked something like this, where employees could ask questions of executives at the company, Enrique um, challenged some of the executives directly about Exxon's history of climate denial. And the company didn't really react very well to that. And within a few months, um, Enrique's internal rating at the company, which determines compensation about, and a bunch of other things, it had been lowered to the lowest possible level. He was placed on probation. And he resigned from the company voluntarily. And now he said he wants to make it his life's work to fix the climate emergency. And it's interesting, and, and over and over again in, in your book, Jeff, um, you point to examples of individuals who had real impact, Enrique being one, um, Patrick Michaels being uh, another on the, on the opposite side, uh, a so-called uh, scientist who, who spread a lot of this misinformation, who mm -hmm. just passed away, I think, just a few, uh, uh, re just recently. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, again, it points to this, this was emergent in the big tobacco um, litigation when it was individuals who came out of those companies or who had, had inside knowledge, knew what was going on, and when they were... Um, uh, able to disclose exactly what had gone on, it, it so often comes down to individual action, like one key person in one mm -hmm. place making, just saying what they know. Yeah, and that's that's kind of like the paradox of of climate change. It's like in in a sense, this is like the biggest collective systemic problem, um, and that's how we've understood it for so long, but I think individuals do have the ability to make a huge difference. And I think one of the biggest ways they can make that difference is either by spreading lies about it or um, exposing the lies. And I, I think that's, that's really what climate change comes down to. It's been a deliberate effort on the part of a relatively small number of players to just confuse us and to get us all um, attacking each other um, and and thinking that fixing the environment is is going to be is going to be horrible for jobs and whatever else um, but I think to the extent that any of us can demonstrate that to be false and sort of like a deliberate malicious campaign that can really accelerate action in a in a very positive direction there are probably a lot of questions um, in the audience. How about we, we put it out to audience questions now? Does anybody have, have questions for Jeff? Yes. Oh, I mean, it's incredibly polarized in Canada. It's, it's, it's hard to even have a, a conversation about addressing climate change without someone yelling like foreign funded radical or you hate Alberta um, or, or anything else. I, I think in, in some ways it's almost you know, more polarized here than in just about any other country on the planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And, and perhaps that's because of the um, outsized uh, um, influence and impact of the oil and gas industry in the Canadian economy. Even in the United States, I don't think the oil and gas industry um, has quite the same relative, you know, overwhelming uh, impact. No, because I, I mean, in, in the U.S., Oil and gas is, is one of just a handful of incredibly powerful industries, including the finance industry, tech, um, you know, a, a bunch of others. So it, it doesn't hold, I mean, it's incredibly powerful, but it doesn't hold the same, like, death grip over the political system that, that it does in Canada. Although it's interesting that I, I feel like the narrative has kind of shifted a little bit away from the climate change or not climate change to carbon tax or no carbon tax. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like, I think we've kind of moved away from the, the climate change isn't happening to, well, your solution doesn't work. It kind of amounts to the same thing. And a bunch of the players who in earlier years were disputing the science now dispute the solutions. Um, and at the end of the day, it it's it's still a strategy reliant on confusing people and and delaying action. Next question there. Um, I think that's a really that's a really interesting point, and I I haven't I didn't interview Naomi Reskus for this book, but I'm I'm very aware of of her work, and I I think it's super interesting. And um, from what I can tell, the PR firms aren't directly named in a lot of these types of lawsuits, but their work was essential to a lot of the campaigns that that we've been talking about. And it wouldn't surprise me if a bunch of them started to be sued in the, the coming years also. That would be, a, that's a very interesting development. I'm gonna mm. go over it and we'll, we'll come back if we've got time for your second question, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's what a lawyer like Steve Berman is trying to do. And so, I mean, the, the parallels to how people talked about smoking are so similar to climate change. Because the idea with smoking forever was that it was an individual choice. Um, so if you got cancer, it was your own fault. And also that um, cancer could come from any number of actors and you couldn't just single out cigarettes. And so a big turning point came when Steve Berman helped get a whole bunch of attorney generals together in the United States and, and quantified the, the money that states were having to spend on um, health care in order to treat people with cancer and then linked that to deliberate lies that the industry had told. And so what you're seeing now with, with kind of the narrative that I describe in this book and the big oil litigation, I think is, is directly inspired by that. Another question here, just in the back. No, just behind you. It, it seems like, uh, given the way that the court system works, that it's going to be a long time before the oil and gas corporations are going to be held accountable. And I'm just wondering why uh, those senior companies haven't uh, joined the, the litigation, you know, the state of California, for, for example. Or mm. I find it hard to believe that Vancouver would Yeah, I mean, it might be a very long time before there's any sort of legal ruling against 
the industry, but I think the main impact of these types of lawsuits is to to change the narrative around climate change and, and to get people to see this as a result of deliberate lies told over the course of, of decades. And I think when that realization really starts to sink in, that, that will change the politics of this quite quickly. And, and you'll see governments, governments react to that. Um, but I mean, I think we are moving closer to a day when there will be a legal ruling in the United States um, some of these individual lawsuits brought by cities have cleared a whole bunch of procedural mm -hmm. hurdles and some of the judges ruling in favor of these lawsuits were actually appointed by Donald Trump and and they I mean as partisan as they might be they have to weigh the evidence and the evidence is pretty damning against some of these companies and I think one of the, the really inter interesting things is I think the public hasn't yet I think the public now has kind of come around on climate change, but I don't think that we have even begun to understand how much this is going to cost the public purse. Mm -hmm. We still are thinking storms. We're not yet thinking, oh my God, this is going to be billions and billions, and we're going to, we're, the government is the insurer of last resort, and we're mm -hmm. going to be paying. You have a question here. Yeah, I mean, there's a, been a pretty deliberate effort to link all the anti-science things and to bring the anti-COVID people over to the anti-climate people. And one person doing a lot of that bridge building is Jordan Peterson, actually. Um, and so he's spoke, spoken out pretty strongly against like mask mandates and other COVID protections. And Jordan Peterson recently has um, become very interested in climate change and He's done a lot of videos recently questioning the science and saying that solutions would be horrible for the economy. And he actually quotes scientists like, or he references scientists like Fred Singer, who I mentioned in the book, who was discredited a very long time ago, um, but is now getting a new life through his association with Jordan Peterson. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> you in the hat. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a very interesting development. And I, I don't have a ton of expertise on that. Um, but I mean, when, when Biden was campaigning to become president, he did promise to, to send the Department of Justice against big polluters. Um, he since seemed to have, have backed off from that. But I, I think the political will for this sort of thing is, is just growing stronger and stronger all the time. Question there. I just want to look at the intensity of the suits uh, that you've done. And so, including through the recession of 2007, 2008, there's been a stream of money, particularly in the US, to go into electricity rated systems. Uh, my experience with that is a lot of that money was poorly spent, it wasn't well spent. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's a lot more money. 
government officials who are responsible for the spending are educating themselves more about policies that are effective, or strategies that are effective, or 20 years from now are you going to be writing a book called The Battery Case? And spend all this money on battery technology and you're just going to keep the same thing. I think anytime you get government spending a ton of money on something, um, some of it will be spent inefficiently and some of it will be wasteful and Republicans made a big deal out of a few spectacular examples in the recession stimulus. Um, but overall people have found that the vast majority of that money really did accelerate um, greener and more renewable technologies and I, th I think the main difference now is that the Biden administration um, when it was staffing um, its government, it brought a lot of the absolute smartest um, people in energy and climate um, into the government to advise on this sort of stuff. Um, and, and the other difference now is that, you know, we have green energy companies that are, are getting so big that they're, you know, rivaling um, oil and gas in terms of the profits and, and size of their operations. And, and so when you have that kind of like private sector interest and influence combined with a lot of government stimulus, I think that that could be quite effective and drive change very fast. It is true that venture capital is just pouring in, private venture capital is just mm -hmm. pouring into renewable technologies at just an astonishing, um, an astonishing rate. I, I think it still remains to be seen in Canada, you know, what are we doing to build our electric, build our electrical grid and develop, uh, develop more renewable energy, which we seriously need. Now, I th I'll come back to you because you had the second question. Berman. Berman, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to be pretty brave if you're going to go up against some of these companies like he did or, or some of these other lawyers or activists. Um, but I, I think just the more the, the truth about some of this stuff gets out there, um, the, the less power that this entire industry has because a a lot of its political influence was built on confusing the public and spreading lies about the science. And once you once you strip that away, that's that's one of the main defenses for the entire industry. And on that note, I think that we have um, completed our. Well, I think we're going to stick with the uh, topic of the book, which is the Petroleum Papers. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you very much to Jeff Dembicki. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Jeff and Sandy, for this conversation, uh, for all of you coming out here on a Wednesday night. Um, our friends from Upstart and Crow are here selling books. Uh, I highly suggest that you get a copy. It's phenomenal. Um, if you haven't visited Upstart and Crow, it's a beautiful bookstore. It's new. It's on Granville Island on Railspur Alley. 
And they do a really interesting job of uh, curating and selecting the books uh, by topics that make you really want to... Actually, I, every time I go there, I end up buying stuff that I wasn't even remotely trying to buy because of the way you select them. So uh, I really recommend you go visit it. It's incredible. Um, before I let you go, I want to tell you about a couple of events coming up soon. Um, oh, also, Jeff's going to do a book signing right outside this room. So buy a book, then line up outside to get your book signed. Um, tomorrow, we're hosting the launch of Harrison Mooney's new memoir, Invisible Boy, which just got published yesterday. Harrison is also VPL's new writer in residence. So this, tomorrow's event is a double um, launch. We're launching the book and we're launching his residency. So come celebrate that. That's going to be downstairs in the Alice Mackay room. And then next week, we have two awesome events. On Monday, right here in this theater, we're going to be screening more than a dozen indigenous short films from the National uh, Film Board's Indigenous Film Collection. So we're going to run them for about three hours. So you can come in at any time from 12 to 3 p.m. on, on Monday and just watch some of the most incredible indigenous short films. Um, and then on Wednesday, uh, we're hosting an online panel conversation on indigenous language revitalization. That's on Zoom. You can watch it from the comfort of your home. And my colleague Candy, standing right there, is running both of those events. So if you want to hear more about those, go talk to Candy. Uh, for more info in general, uh, follow us on all of our socials. That's where we publish most of the event information and or the website, or come talk to me after the event. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>